Tonight we have Jane Clark in Ireland, Jane Hirschfield in America, and Arundhati Subramaniam in Bombay in India. Um, I'm going to introduce the poets before they read individually, and they're going to read twice. Uh, so you'll hear first from Jane Clark, and then Jane Hirschfield, and then from Arundhati Subramaniam. They've all published books either this year or, or just recently, the end of last year. So we'll start with Jane Clark. Jane Clark's lyrically eloquent poems bear witness to the rhythms of birth and death, uh, celebration and mourning, endurance and regrowth. She's published two collections, The River in 2015 and When the Tree Falls in 2019. An elegiac sequence inspired by the loss of her father moves gracefully through When the Tree Falls. Rooted in the everyday and backlit by mystery, these are poems to savour and return to, for the pleasure of finely honed lines that powerfully evoke the depth of our connections to people, place and nature. Jane Clark grew up on a farm in County Roscommon in Ireland and now lives in County Wicklow. She combines her writing with work as a creative writing tutor and group facilitator, and she has a background in psychoanalytic psychotherapy. Her first collection, The River, was shortlisted for the Royal Society of Literature's Ondaatje Prize, given for a distinguished work of fiction, non-fiction or poetry, evoking the spirit of a place. And her second collection, When the Tree Falls, was shortlisted for the 2020 Piggott Poetry Prize, the Irish Times Poetry Now Award, and the Farmgate Cafe National Poetry Award 2020, as well as being long listed for the Royal Society of Literature's uh, Ondaatje Prize uh, 220. Um, Jane is in uh, County Wicklow, and um, I'd just like now to introduce Jane. Would you please welcome Jane? Thanks very much, Neil. Um, I'm delighted to read tonight with Jane and Aaron Datty, and uh, the international reach of the reading is really exciting to me. Um, I don't know what the weather is like where everybody who's watching this is, but here in Wicklow, it's dark and windy and wet tonight. And it's for just such a night that I wrote this poem. When winter comes, remember what the blacksmith knows. Dim light is best at the furnace to see the colours go from red to orange to yellow. The forging heat that tells the steel is ready to be held in the mouth of the tongs. And it's time to lengthen and narrow with the ring of the hammer on the horn of an anvil. To bend until the forgiving metal has found its form. Then file the burrs, remove sharp edges, smooth the surface, Polish with a grinding stone and see it shine like gold. So, uh, as Neil said, there's an elegiac sequence going through uh, my recently published uh, When the Tree Falls. Um, and it's from the illness of my father, the time we nursed him at home, then his death in January 2017, and the time of mourning after that. So I'm going to start, so this section of the reading, I'm going to take some of those poems from the sequence. So I'm going to start with one um, which was, uh, came from about May 2016. He stood at the top of the stairs, insisting he could go down himself, but like a frightened bullock refusing the crush, his body wouldn't move from the spot where I used to sit in the dark, listening to rows in the kitchen when my mother showed him the bill from the shop. He stood at the top of the stairs in a fever that came on him as fast as nightfall in winter. Steep, narrow steps between him and the ambulance ticking outside the back door. He stood there in check pyjamas and thick Wellington socks in the house where he was born and swore he would never leave. 
I held him from behind, my brother in front, coaxing with the tenderness I'd never seen between them. Come on, Dad, just one step, one step. So um, these, this poem was written uh, probably around this time of year, uh, four years ago. I've got you. Through days of morphine and tidbits to tempt his appetite, there's nowhere else to be. I hold his teacup to his lips, wash his face and the hands I rarely touch. During the night, old hurts and worries surface like stones in a well-tilled field. What time is it now? He asks on the hour. He sings to himself and murmurs lines he learned as a child. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. When he asks to get up, I hold his wrists, brace my weight against his. For a moment, he's confused. It's okay, Janie, I've got you. Go on now, you can stand. And so the next poem is, is from some months after my father died. And sometimes people, you know, said to me, you know, that must have been so hard when your father was ill and also had a friend ill at that time. And I was saying, no, now is the harder time when he's gone, when they're gone. So that this poem ref reflects that. Moon. Not that those months minding him were easy. Anxiety spreading like cleavers through a perennial bed. Sleeplessness leaving us vexed as wasps facing winter. Our questions circling ever closer to the edge. But compared to this, they were white and pink splashed blossoms on briar roses in June. Dusty hedgerows mottled with peacocks and common blues. Unmapped, grass-lined byroads, moonlight everywhere. And uh, just two more poems in this section. Um, the title poem of the collection, When the Tree Falls, is kind of a meditation about the change that happens when a big space in your life or a big presence in your life is gone. Um, but also something about the necessity of death to create space for new life. When the tree falls into the river, it slows the current. Water pools in the hollows it makes. Pike and trout find a new place to hide. Beetles, mayfly and mites feed on leaf litter. The mossy trunk lies still as a bridge. A kingfisher settles, watches for minnow. Branches reach for the light, noble with new buds. And uh, so the last poem I'll read at this point is the final poem in the collection. And it was written 18 months after we lost my father, when I had regained a sense of his presence in the farm where he had lived all his life. Kelly's Garden. You can find him in the names of the fields. Kelly's Garden, Bacchanopton's, Malbrannan's, the Sandhole, the Quarry, the Rocks. He's stacking square bales, chanting knots in and down, so rain won't lodge in their hearts. March, and he's cursing merciless wind, cattle running <coughs> amok. He's laughing at McAleer's joke about the father who welcomes his eldest home from Alberta or Azerbaijan with the only question that matters, 
were there many on the bus. You can hear them in the jackdaws, chuck, chuck, up high on galvanized roofs, and in his whistling that rises and falls like the curlew calling from Emla Bog. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Now we're going to hear from Jane Hirschfield. Um, Jane Hirschfield is a visionary American writer whose poems ask nothing less than what it is to be human. Both sensual meditations and passionate investigations, they reveal complex truths in language, luminous and precise. Rooted in the living world, her poems celebrate and elucidate a hard-won affirmation of our human fate. Her urgent new collection, Ledger, is a book of personal, ecological and political reckoning. These poems inscribe a ledger personal and communal, a registry of our times and lives dilemmas, as well as a call to action on climate change, social justice, and the plight of refugees. Jane Hirschfield's first book of poetry published in the UK was Each Happiness Ringed by Lions, selected poems published by Blood Axe in, 2004, in um, 2005. This was followed by two later collections also from Blood Axe, After, which was a poetry book society choice, also shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize, Come Thief, The Beauty, and now Ledger, which came out in March of this year. And she lives in the Mill Valley of Northern California, which is where she's reading from tonight. So please welcome Jane Hirschfield. Thank you so much, Neil and Blood Axe, for um, hosting this evening and for publishing the extraordinary roster you do. Jane, that was an amazing reading. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to make the first set of poems I give you uh, draw from the more public part of uh, this book's concerns. So some poems of the crisis of the biosphere and of social compact. The first one is kind of ranging. It was uh, written in Florida during a season when uh, the island I was staying on five feet above sea level was so deluged with sea rise and rainstorms that we were wading calf deep in the climate crisis. And I was convinced this was no longer something of the future. Um, but the poem talks about the geomorphology of Florida. It talks about evolution. It talks about the civil war in Syria, the crisis of refugees. Um, so it, it does uh, travel a bit. Day beginning with seeing the International Space Station and a full moon over the Gulf of Mexico and all its invisible fishes. None of this had to happen. Not Florida, not the ibis's beak, not water, not the horseshoe crab's empty body, and not the living starfish. Evolution might have turned left at the corner and gone down another street entirely. The asteroid might have missed. The seams of limestone need not have been susceptible to sand and mangroves. The radio might have found a different music. The hips of one man and the hips of another might have stood beside each other on a bus in Aleppo and recognized themselves as long lost brothers. The key could have broken off in the lock and the nail can refused its lid. I might have been the fish the brown pelican swallowed. You might have been the way the moon kept not setting long after we thought it would, long after the sun was catching inside the low wave curls coming in at a certain angle. The light might not have been eaten again by its moving. If the unbearable were not weightless, we might yet buckle under the grief of what hasn't changed yet. Across the world, a man pulls a woman from the water from which the leapt from overfilled boat has entirely vanished. From the water pulls one child, another. Both are living and both will continue to live. 
This did not have to happen. No part of this had to happen. Poems change their meanings as the times change. Uh, the poem I'll read you next uh, is the earliest one written in the book. It was written entirely speaking towards climate change, a poem that looks to the future's judgment of us and hopes by its saying to prove itself to have been wrong. Um, but then it was published almost four years ago on the day of the American uh, presidential inauguration and began circulating rather widely as a political poem. And that works too. Let them not say. Let them not say we did not see it, we saw. Let them not say we did not hear it, we heard. Let them not say they did not taste it, we ate, we trembled. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written, we spoke, we witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing, we did not enough. Let them say, as they must say something, a kerosene beauty, it burned. Let them say we warmed ourselves by it, read by its light, praised, and it burned. Now, this book is called Ledger because we stand on a ledge and because we try to take some accounting of the unaccountable. Uh, that is the work of poems, not to fathom the answerable questions, but to find some response to the unanswerable ones. Uh, so this is a poem that has some of that accounting in it. As if hearing heavy furniture moved on the floor above us. As things grow rarer, they enter the ranges of counting. Remain this many Siberian tigers, that many African elephants. 300 red-legged egrets. We scrape from the world its tilt and meander of wonder as if eating the last burned onions and carrots from a cast iron pan. Closing eyes to taste better the char of ordinary sweetness. And I will finish this section uh, with a poem simpler. I actually quite like very short poems. Uh, this isn't the shortest, um, but a little, a little briefer. No wind, no rain. No wind, no rain. The tree just fell as a piece of fruit does. But no, not fruit, not ripe, not fell. It broke. It shattered. One cone's addition of resinous cell sap, one small-bodied bird arriving to tap for a beetle. It shattered. What word, what act was it we thought did not matter? Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. That beautiful reading. Second of our beautiful readings tonight. We're now going to hear from Arundhati Subramanian, an award-winning poet and writer on spirituality and culture. The poems of her latest collection, Love Without a Story, celebrate an expanding kinship of passion and friendship, mythic quest and modern day longing in a world animated by dialogue and dissent, delirium and silence. Circling the themes of intimacy and time, they return to the urgency of conversation, that fragile bridge across the frozen attitudes that divide our world. Life Without a Story is her third book from Blood Axe, following that Where I Live, New and Selective Poems, and When God is a Traveller, which was a poetry book society choice, which was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. She's also written The Book of Buddha, published by Penguin, and Sad Sadguru, More Than a Life, also published by Penguin, and she co-edited Confronting Love from Penguin, an anthology of Indian love poems in English,
and she edited Pilgrim's India, an anthology, and Eating God, a book of Bhakti poetry, also from Penguin. She's currently based in Mumbai, or Bombay, as she, like many, still prefer to call it, and she divides her time between India and New York. So would you please welcome Arundhati Subramanian. Thank you, Neil. And I just want to say it's been wonderful listening to two fabulous voices. So I'd be quite happy to go on in listener mode, but I'm going to add my voice to the chorus. And I just think of this as one wonderful celebration. Thank you for making this happen. I'm going to start with the very first poem in my book, which is a poem that might resonate with those of you who have admired a poet and then made the mistake of meeting her or him. Sometimes that can produce the kind of anticlimax that it can take a lifetime to recover from. So this poem has an epigraph by Eunice D'Souza, the Indian poet, who says, best to meet in poems. I grew up in an age of poets. I grew up in an age of poets who told me joy was for cabbages until I found that beneath their smoking empires of sulfur, there lay a shiver of doubt that they wondered as I did about what it might mean to be leafy, to wilt, to be damaged sometimes by upstart caterpillars and still stay green, chaotically, wetly, powerfully green. Now, I meet poets who exchange visiting cards, are best friends with the dentist, all dankness deodorized, their poems cool seashells, their laughter splintered eggshells, poets who never seem to wonder about cabbages at all. Still best to meet in poems. And this is a poem called, If It Must Be Now, echoing, I think, some of the resonances that have come up in both the earlier readings. If It Must Be Now. When glaciers thaw and find that there's nothing perma about frost, let there be the shock of release from petrified attitude into melted light and fuzzy velocity, liberation from angle and the deep blue plaque of fear into pure continuum, a kind of joy even. Here then is the prayer and the time is always 3 a.m. Let liquefaction not mean liquidation. This is a poem called Tongue and it has uh, a line from John Berger which goes, the tongue is alone and tethered in its mouth. And that becomes the epigraph to this poem. The man in front of me is reading a balance sheet. He is smiling, his gaze shimmying between columns, effortlessly bilingual. And though a little drunk on the liquor of profit, I like to believe he is not immune to the sharp beauty of integers simmering with their own inner life. And I wonder if he feels the way I do sometimes around words, waiting for them to lead me past the shudder of taproot, past the inkiness of groundwater to those places where all tongues meet. Calculus, Persian, Cock Baroque, Flamenco, the tongue that sparrows know, and accountants, and those palm trees at the far end of holiday photographs, your tongue, mine, the kiss that knows from where the first songs sprang, forested and densely plural. <laughs> 
the kiss that knows no separation. I'm going to read just one very short poem from a much longer poem cycle. And I must read it because in some ways it is the most integral to the book for me. It's about an old woman, a wise woman, a poet, a traveler, a mythic figure of South India. She's called Abhayar. And I'm curious about her. And this is a poem that really about that essential curiosity. What is it that makes this woman choose, voluntarily choose old age. It's the figure of the crone that I think recurs in so many mythologies and she fascinates me. So she fascinates me as this figure who abandons collagen, spirulina, vitamin E, macadamia, nuts, extracts of green tea, triclosan, selenium, propylene, glycol, alpha hydroxy acids, bergamot, retinol. Avayar makes another choice. Avayad lives in a face where the civil war is almost over. Frayed flags of peace hoisted, cavalry slumbering, garrison emptied. Nothing to declare anymore, she says, not even nostalgia. Perhaps just a few ruined keepsakes, a bottle of limoncello from a sun slathered June in Amalfi, a butterscotch moon from a Tel Aviv hotel, a picture of a cat, pink board, yogic, for lovers flatten into photographs, photographs into reminiscence, reminiscence into quiet. And then what's left? Perhaps just the oldest thing in the world, love without a story. I think I'll conclude there. Thank you very much, Arundhati. Um, we're now gonna go back to Jane Clark in County Wicklow. And if you look behind her on her, on her wall, she actually has uh, a map of that part of Ireland and the brown bit in the map is where she's reading from tonight. Jane. Thanks very much, Neil. And, uh, Thanks again to Jane and Arundhati. It's wonderful to, as I, what Arundhati calls this chorus of voices. It really is a privilege to be part of this with the two of you. Um, so this, in this reading, I wanted to start with three poems, which in some way uh, reflect the changes in Irish society, even since I started writing poetry about 14 years ago. And um, one of the changes, uh, for the better, is that uh, women's role in the Irish rebellion in 1916 was at last acknowledged. And um, this poem is dedicated to two of those women who along with many other women worked hard for independence, but they also had a vision for social justice, which didn't come to fruition. So we did get our independence, but then we entered into a really conservative time in Irish society, which has lasted until very recently. Um, so in Glasnevin, Finding the words carved on their plain granite headstone. Faithful comrade, lifelong friend. Reminds me of my grandmother who used to say, there was none of that in our day. I wish I could ask the faithful Julia and Elizabeth. Were they grateful for the mercy of sharing a grave? Did they choose those words to save them from shame? Did they have someone to tell that though the words said so much, they didn't say enough? And when they nursed the rebellion's wounded, did they question the cost of a new free state? So that leads on to the next poem for me because I was coming out as a lesbian in the 80s and uh, it was a hard time, it was a time of hiding and 
so much secrecy and so much else that was hidden in Irish society. But sometimes people now sort of look back to that time with a bit of nostalgia. And this is my answer to the nostalgia. Those days, we had to claim a space for love in the half hidden places. A back room in Smith's, the top floor of a pub on a lane by the Liffey. Looking back, we could say it was worth it for the welcome when we stepped in from the cold, for the pleasure of removing masks with our shrugged off coats, for our bodies pulsing to I will survive. That would be comforting, but a lie. And the third of these poems, we, you know, in recent years, we got marriage equality, which was a wonderful change in Irish society. But also in 2018, there was a vote to change uh, the, in our legislation that allowed the government to legislate for abortion at last. But it was, of course, a very difficult topic to be discussed in Irish society and it was very painful for many people and there were very different views and I suppose what I thought is people were so respectful at the time in general and people there was great understanding about the difficulty of this and uh, so this is set at our polling station just down the hill from us here and um, <clears throat> polling station May 25th 2018 in the queue up to the door of the schoolhouse, neighbours welcome sunshine after the wettest of wet winters. Spirits lift at the sight of fields drying out, grass thickening, calves thriving, unstoppable growth. There's talk of young ones speeding home to vote, swallows back to the barn. No one asks anyone where they'll place their ex. Every family has stories left like ploughs and harrows among thistles behind the sheds. Okay, so I, I wanted to read uh, just two new poems. And the first of these is from last April. And one of the impacts of the pandem pandemic is that we couldn't have the kind of wake or funerals we would usually have in Irish communities. And uh, you know the, the huge funerals that are traditional in Ireland, they acknowledge you know, the person who has died, but I also think they're saying to the loved ones, of that person, we're with you, you're not alone. And so that was that was really difficult. That was a huge loss to people. So, but we, we sort of developed a new ritual where people stood at their gates um, as the hearse went down the road. And this happened in the early weeks of the pandemic uh, when a neighbor across uh, the road from us died. First Aries. By rights, we'd be standing side by side, making idle conversation as we wait to shake hands with grieving neighbours after requiem mass in Green Anne. But we keep the by road between us today. The virus lingers, a low-lying cloud until someone asks about planting first airlies and advice flies from gateway to gateway. You can split seed potatoes as long as each half has a chit. Dig plenty of manure into the drill. Place them a foot apart, a fist deep. Don't forget to earth up the shoots. They'll be ready for lifting mid-June. Sharps Express, Satanta, Orla, Slaney, Red Cara, Accord, our litanies only hushed by the hearse coming down the road. And uh, my last poem this evening 
And uh, yeah, uh, before I read it, just again, thanks very much, Neil, for organising this and to all in Blood Axe for a tremendous support to my, for my work as a writer. And thanks to my fellow readers and thanks to whoever's out there watching. And um, uh, this, this poem I was asked to read as a response to what we had been going through in Ireland with the pandemic, but also as a way of looking to the future. And uh, it was quite a job to find how could I do that, uh, but I went to see these little birds that nest uh, on the coast of County Wicklow and they gave me uh, what I needed to make this poem. Little Turn Colony, Kilcool. In shallow nests among pebbles, most of the eggs survived the high tides. August slips into September. The fledglings, light as whelk shells, get ready to fly. The sun and stars will guide them, and though they'll be hungry, thirsty, cold, the earth's magnetic field will pulse in their hearts like hope. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, and so the audience knows we will be coming all together at the end of the event to, for a chat. Um, thanks for that last poem, the last two new poems, the last poem, Looking Forward, which is what we very much want to do at the moment. Um, we're now going to move from a rainy night in Wicklow to this morning in California. Uh, so I'd like to welcome back Jane Hirschfield. Thank you. As I've been listening, I completely changed my second set of poems because I kept thinking of this and that, listening to these marvelous readings. So I'm going to read you only one from the set I had originally planned. Uh, there's a series of poems in Ledger which all were precipitated by the long illness and finally death of somebody I'd loved for 40 years. Um, and I was planning on dedicating the whole section of the reading, and I still will, to the thought of those who have died and the thought of those who have lost loved ones and acquaintances and people we don't even know to this time of pandemic. So just one poem from that series, Pelt. Little soul, the book of your hours is closing over its golds, its reds, your gazing dog, your rivers, ladders, ribcage. A life turns into its patterns and perfumes, then into its pelt. I don't know now if we were one, if we were two, a stippling. Whither thou goest, we'd said. This next poem I thought I had to read um, because Arundhati gave us her marvelous poem uh, with the tongue so prominently in it. And I also have a poem with the tongue rather prominently in it. And I just thought it would be interesting for people to uh, hear how, how one impulse unfolds in varying ways. And yet in a couple of ways, quite similar. Um, this poem comes very much from the, from the old world ways when all we poets were flying all over the earth uh, to give readings here and there. It feels to me uh, rather unfathomable uh, now. In a former coal mine in Silesia. In a former coal mine in Silesia, a thousand feet inside the earth, a tongue kept speaking. In the Arctic, by the triangular door to the Svalbard seed vault, a tongue almost fearless, almost not clumsy, spoke. Spoke verbs, conjunctions, adjectives, adverbs, nouns. In a small town in the Australian outback, in the city of Nanjing, near a gate still recalling unthinkable closures. By a lake in Montana, a tongue almost steady, almost not stumbling, spoke facts, hypotheses, memories, riddles, stories. 
lungs accept their oxygen without trembling. Feet stand inside their foot shapes, inside shoes someone has sewn. We close the eyes of the dead so they will not see their not seeing. Light falls on the retina's stubbornness, on pupils refusing to turn toward or away. Fireflies, furnaces, quicksilvers fill them, cities and forests glinting, though already finished. And the tongues, the faithless tongues, continue speaking as lovers will, because they still love. Long past the hour, there is nothing left to say. I wanted to be surprised. To such a request, the world is obliging. In just the past week, a rotund porcupine who seemed equally startled by me. The man who swallowed a tiny microphone to record the sounds of his body, not considering beforehand how he might remove it. A cabbage and mustard sandwich on marbled bread. How easily the large spiders were caught with a clear plastic cup surprised even them. I don't know why I was surprised every time love started or ended, or why each time a new fossil, earth-like planet, or war, or that no one kept being there when the doorknob had clearly. What should not have been so surprising, my error after error recognized when appearing on the faces of others. What did not surprise enough? My daily expectation that anything would continue and then that so much did continue when so much did not. Small rivulets still flowing downhill when it wasn't raining, a sister's birthday. Also the stubborn, courteous persistence that even today, please means please. Good morning is still understood as good morning. And that when I wake up, this window's distant mountain remains a mountain. The borrowed city around me is still a city and standing. It's alleys and markets, offices of dentists, drugstore, liquor store, Chevron. It's library that charges a happy surprise, no fine for overdue books. Borges, Baldwin, Zimborska, Morrison, Kavafi. And I will give you one more poem. Vest. I put on again the vest of many pockets. It is easy to forget which holds the reading glasses, which the small pen, which the house keys, the compass and whistle, the passport. To forget at last for weeks, even the pocket holding the day of digging a place for my sister's ashes, the one holding the day where someone will soon enough put my own to misplace the pocket of touching the walls at Auschwitz would seem impossible. It is not. To misplace for a decade the pocket of tears. I rummage and rummage. Transfers from Munich from Melbourne to Oslo. A receipt for a Singapore copy. A device holding music. Bach, Garcia, Richter, Porter. Pert. A woman long dead now gave me, when I told her I could not sing, a kazoo, now in a pocket. Somewhere a pocket holding a Steinway. Somewhere a pocket holding a packet of salt. Borgesian vest, Oxford English dictionary vest with a magnifying glass tucked inside one snapped closed pocket, Wikipedia vest, Rosetta vest, Enigma vest, 
of decoding. How is it one person can carry your weight for a lifetime, one person slip into your open arms for a lifetime? Who was given the world and hunted for tissues for chapstick? Thank you, Jane. Thank you very much. And Jane there has been taking us all around the world. Um, we're now going to move from this morning in California to tomorrow morning in India, because where Arundhati is, I think it's about um, getting on for one o'clock in the morning. Absolutely. It's just about 1.15. A couple of years ago, when I was in the UK, I was asked by a reader how she could understand references to Indian myth in some of my poems. And I told her that she was free to read it just the way I often read mythology from around the world, which is to read it and allow myself to forget it. And yet what penetrates into the marrow is really what counts and that is the power of myth. And you don't have to make an effort to remember that how to read Indian myth for A.S. who wonders. How to read Indian myth, the way I read Greek, I suppose, not worrying too much about foreign names and plots, knowing there is never a single point to any story. Taking the red hibiscus root into the skin, alert to trapdoors, willing to blunder a little in the dark, slightly drunk on Deccan sun. But with a spring in the step that knows that we are fundamentally corky, built to float, built to understand. And the chemical into which we are tumbling will sustain, has sustained before, knows a way through knows a way beyond, knows that the two aren't separate. Read it like you would read a love story. Your own. I've been fascinated for a long time by Indian bhakti poetry or medieval devotional poetry, and particularly a strand of it that allows you to rage at God and still love him. Or her. And that idea that you can hurl cuss words at God and abuse God and still be madly in love is an idea that I find empowering and uh, freeing in so many ways. And so this is my version of what is called the Ninda Stuti. Ninda in Sanskrit means complaint and Stuti is a song of praise. This is my song of praise and complaint. And it has an epigraph by Hafiz, the Persian poet who says, complaint is only possible while living in the suburbs of God. And since I am very much a suburban person when it comes to my relationship with the sacred, my nindastuti goes thus. We are not impressed by your platoons of admirers, your raging eyes, your guest lists, your visiting cards, your seven horse chariots, your LED screens. We aren't minor either. If it's about choosing between big and small, form and vacancy, we choose neither. If you're playing the game, we are too. We come from a tribe that knows that a versified tantrum is a kind of prayer. We turn invective into love, salty, sometimes sulfuric, and love into obscenity. Our longing reaches for the stars. Domesticated by our fury, even the skies turn terrestrial. And the rest of the time, the earth, this lunatic suburb, is plenty. I'm going to move to uh, poem that might touch a chord with those of you who grew up like I did, believing that my parents were landscape. And there came a time 
sometime in my childhood when there was a jolt of recognition, when I suddenly realized, oh my God, these are full-fledged autonomous human beings. When landscape becomes woman. I was eight when I looked through a keyhole and saw my mother in the drawing room in her hibiscus silk sari, her fingers slender around a glass of iced cola. And I grew suddenly shy for not having seen her before. I knew her well, of course, serene undulation of blue malmal, wrist serrated by thin gold bangle, the gentle convexity of mole on upper right arm and her high arched feet better than I knew myself. And I knew her voice like running water, ice cubes in cola. But through the keyhole at the grown up party, she was no longer geography. She seemed to know how to incline her neck, just when to sip her swirly drink, and she understood the language of baritone voices and lacquered nails and words like emergency. I could have watched her all night. And that's how I discovered that keyholes always reveal more than doorways. That a chink in the wall is all you need to tumble into a parallel universe. That mothers are women. I have a bunch of goddess poems and that's because I live in South India. I've spent a lot of my time in South India and I happen to be Tamilian. And South India is a region replete with goddess temples. So it's a bit difficult to go untouched by them. I'm going to read a very short goddess poem and then move on to the last one. This is after the goddess Linga Bhairavi. She sucks you into the raging blue wilderness of her womb, where you wear her like cocoon, you wear her like cosmos, through which you reel exuberantly unborn. Goddess too. In her burning rainforest, silence is so alive, you can hear listening. And I'm going to read a poem, I'm going to conclude with a poem called Mitti, which in Hindi means mud. And I realized that there are a fair number of poems in this book that invoke the elements, earth, water, fire, and of course mud had to be part of it. And I trusted this poem because it unfolded into a poem about the role of the poet, about uh, diversity, about language. And so it became a, a bit of a larger poem than I originally intended it to be. Mitti. As a child, I ate mud. It tasted of grit and peat and wild churning and something else that I could never quite find a name for. Later, I became a moon gazer, always squinting through windows, believing that freedom was aerial, until I figured that the moon was a likely mud gazer, longing for the thick sludge of gravity, the promiscuous thrill of touch, the license to break, to make, to remake. And so I uncovered the old role of poets to be messengers between moon and mud. And I began to uncover the many languages of earth that have nothing to do with nations and atlases and everything to do with the ways of earwigs, the pilgrim trail of roots, the great longing of life to hold and be held and the irrepressible human love of naming. Ooze, Maya, manure, Humus, dirt, silt, mold, loam, soil, slush, clay, shit, manne, matope, baro, tinen, ni, 
luto, fango, all have their place, I found, in the democracy of tongues. None superior, none untranslatable, all reminders of the anthem of muck of which we are made. Except when June clouds capsize over an Arabian sea and a sleeping city awakens to an ache so singular that for just a moment it could have no name. Other than that where sound meets sense and a slop of matter meets a slick lunatic wetness, mitti, just that, nothing else will do. Thank you. Thank you, Arundhati, uh, for bringing us down to earth with the anthem of muck. Um, we're going to move into a discussion mode now. Um, if you have any questions, do feel free to put them into the chat line. Um, I've also asked our guests tonight whether they'd like to ask each other a few things. Um, so I'm sure we'll get this going quite quickly. A um, couple of things first. Um, Jane asked me why it was that I chose you three poets to put on together, quite apart from Arundhati being the poet with the most recent book. And I thought about it and I said, well, you're all menches. Um, you know, in America, American uh, Jewish society, there's this notion of a mensch, and it's usually a man. Um, but I don't, I think, I don't know what the, whether there's a female word for a mensch, but I do think that um, you are all menches. And I think the audience watching this tonight won't question why it was that I thought you would all work very well together. You're all very different, but I think there is a kind of unifying voice and sense of humanity which comes through all your work as well as being grounded as Arundhati showed in in that last poem. Um, there's also some interesting connections. Um, I didn't know until we set this reading up that um, Jane Clark, when Jane Clark started writing she was very much inspired by Jane Hirschfield. Um, perhaps we could kick off with that Jane, uh, Jane Clark. Um, and you might say something about that. Yes, uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, yeah, when uh, when Neil invited me to do this reading, I was uh, I was so thrilled. And um, in fact, Jane, for our civil partnership, when my partner and I were able to have our kind of wedding ceremony back in 2011, I read your poem "Blessing for a Wedding" at it. Uh, <laughs> so, it, you know, there's something lovely about this now happening. Um, but I suppose I just always, I, I, I like the way both of you write. I think you bring a light touch to very profound subjects. And uh, the lightness allows us in. And I mean, the lightness in Narendati reminds me of how I think the gods, the Hindu gods, there's lots of laughter and there's lots of um, naughty behavior. And it's not about saintly as we think of it, you know, here. And I suppose there's that, light, that fun uh, that both of you bring to these very profound subjects. And I suppose the humanity uh, that Neil was talking about as well. Yeah. If I could just interject at this point, I wanted to say that, you know, I was struck by the fact, I read your river poem, uh, Jane, I mean, Jane Clark here, I mean, I read your river poem some years ago, and I remember being very struck by it because of that image of the water moving upstream. And that always stayed with me. It's a wonderful image that comes from the Buddhist tradition as well of the Buddha's, uh, at, at the time of his enlightenment, uh, you know, he wants to know whether this is, whether his, uh, I think it's a leaf that will move upstream or down. And he says, if it moves upstream, it moves towards it. His enlightenment is assured. So there were lots of resonances for me there. And the fact that we were talking about um, the environment in so many ways, all three of us today, I mm -hmm. felt that for me became something very real, a very uh, organic connection. Mm -hmm. But I also must say to Jane, and here I mean the other Jane, Hirschfield, how much her translations of Mida with Robert Bly have meant to me. And in fact, when I was putting together my own anthology, this Penguin India anthology of Bhakti poetry, 
I wanted to draw on those poems. And I couldn't, I must say here, because of, um, it was just far too expensive for Penguin India. So I hope that if there is a future anthology, Jane, that there will be some way we can actually draw on those poems. They're rich and lyrical. And at the same time, they have spine, which is something that I think is true of your work, but it's certainly true of those translations. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, yes, I couldn't help but think, you know, listening to your poems, which made reference to the tradition of, or the many, many traditions of Indian spirituality uh, of both the Mirabai poems and then in a much earlier anthology that came out in 1994, I included quite a few of the mystic poets of both Northern and Southern India. It is one of the great spiritual traditions of the world. So that book, Women in Praise of the Sacred, 43 mm -hmm. centuries of, of women's spiritual poetry. Um, but what, what I notice in part in, in, uh, as, a, as a common thread for, for each of us is the way that allegiance to the large recognizes that its only expression is in the precise, the detailed, and the daily. And so, you know, I was just soaking in, you know, like, like thirsty ground under rain. Um, the, the detailed particulars of each of your work, but also the way those particulars are always working to say something about experience, about the world, about reality, about human lives. Each of your poems are plows that, that have traction and turn the soil of the psyche and the heart and the spirit and the understanding in remarkable ways. Um, and I think, you know, for each of us, even, you know, Arundhati, you have more references to, to um, the spiritual by, by almost name than, than either Jane Clark or I do. But I think each of us has a certain fidelity to the expression of the ordinary as inseparable from the recognition of the large, the sacred interconnection, interdependence. And, and this has just been such a delicious experience for me to, to share um, a reading with, with each of you. I hope we ever get to do it in, in, in the world of actual planks and shared air again. <laughs> That should, that should be an ambition for us after the pandemic to try and bring you together live. That would be wonderful. Wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, I've got a question here for Jane Hirschfield. Um, you mentioned um, Miwash and Shimborshko in your poems, and Alec has sent this question through the chat line. What do you think Polish poetry has taught you about poetry in general? Uh, Polish poetry changed my life. It was probably the most recent of the large bodies of work that transformed my own work. I have always been a reader of the world's poetry. It is one reason I love Blood Axe so much is because it is a publisher of the world's poetry. And what discovering, I discovered Zimborska very early in 1982. She and I shared a, 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 a series publishing uh, books, a very small press no longer existent, but it meant that I read her almost earlier than anyone. Um, Miłosz I discovered later than I should have, but in 1979, when, when Echo brought out a selection of his poems here in America. Um, there, there were earlier availabilities, but I was too young to see them. And for me, it was worldview. It was a stance towards existence and the language in which it was held. Now, these are very different poets. The Zimborska's poems would not be mistaken for Miłosz's poems, which would not be mistaken for Zbigniew Herbert's poems or Rosevich or Anna Svir. They are all distinctive. And yet there is some sensibility, which perhaps comes from the shared experience of a place in history and, and what that generation or two generations of poets lived through, which for me made my understanding of the world change and my understanding of the possibilities of poetry change. 
I also have to have to say, you know, having heard Chesov read many times and and become at the end of his life, probably the youngest and last of his American friends, that uh, I, I began to appreciate the presence of the comic in poetry. When he read, he would just twinkle with laughter at, at a number of the poems. And that leavening yeast of laughter, you know, uh, many, many, many decades ago, if I had one chuckle a book, that was pretty good. And now I might be up to seven or nine. <laughs> But thank you for the question, just because it lets me ponder a body of work which was life changing for me. And maybe uh, each of each of uh, Jane Clark and and Arundhati could say, did you have some similar infusion in the middle of your development of a poet where you discovered something you hadn't known and it really expanded your sense of what poems could do and be? Jane, go ahead, go ahead. But you must unmute. Yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, well, Jane, I mean, just to say that Malash is one of my favorites as well. And I do think there's something about what was going on in Poland and the forced emigration. So many of them had to leave home. And that theme of love for a home place which is, I mean, it's, it's, it's so influential in so many literatures all over, you know, from all over the world and that kind of keening for home and the distance. I mean, it seemed to me that because people had to leave, then uh, they saw their homes more clearly, really. And out of that, were able to give us, you know, this, this, these condensed meditations about what it means to love a place and a people. Um, but yeah, so that's all that I would add there. I'm just wondering for Aaron Datty. Yeah, I think it's a lovely question, but it would set me thinking, I think I grew up because I grew up in Bombay, which is a city of many languages. I grew up like most Indians, polyglottal and at the same time, I had an English literature education, so I was very exposed to an Anglo-American canon growing up. I had parents who were second, third generation English speakers. At the same time, they spoke Tamil and Hindi, so there were other languages around me. But it was much later in my life. So I was aware of different languages and different literary traditions, but I felt very drawn to the Anglo-American because that's what I was steeped in, immersed in growing up. At the same time, I studied classical dance. So there was a certain uh, excitement about uh, poetry um, in, in at least in the Southern Indian languages and Sanskrit. But I must say it was only when I was derailed in a manner of speaking by a, by a journey that I now call a spiritual journey. But when it tripped me up big time is when I reached for the Bhakti poets and they came to my rescue and they became for me the literary ancestors I was looking for. So without debunking any of the earlier ones who, who continue to remain important, I must say that the way in which they resuscitated me by just reminding me that there is a way to be both sensual and to reach for something smoky and intangible at the same time, to be both. Uh, I think they're the ones I would look to now as uh, hugely significant in my life. What about the Indian poets writing in English um, or in more than one language like uh, Arun Kalaka? Were they important Absolutely. to you? Yeah, they were, Neil. Actually, I should have mentioned them too. I think growing, growing up in Bombay, I was aware that there was a kind of uh, ecosystem I could draw on. And many of them were Anglophone poets in Bombay. Arun Kalaka certainly was very significant. And there were so many others in Bombay, Eunice D'Souza, whom I mentioned, and Intiaz Dharkar, and um, Adil Jasawala, Geet Patel, they were all part of one's landscape, and that was important. It was later again in my life, along with the Bhakti poets, that I also discovered for myself A.K. Ramanujan, yes. who is, um, you know, such a remarkable translator of a lot of the sacred poetry, and is also such a fine poet. And I don't think I had quite uh, plumbed those depths before, you know, just discovered uh, 
those uh, riches earlier. I've got a couple, sorry, Jane. I have such enormous gratitude for poets like Romano John, who brought a body of work into visibility for, you know, we grew up as a generation in a world where the world's literature was available to us in a way that was not true a hundred years before. And, you know, Romano John uh, made available to other poets who could then expand the books, but I completely agree his own poetry is marvelous. And, you know, a person who I perhaps correctly, perhaps incorrectly think of as in his lineage, um, Arvind Krishna Marotra, was, was a great discovery for me amongst the uh, Anglophone Indian, Indian poets. But, you know, I wouldn't have been able to read Joseph Miwoj if he had not been brought into English. I would not have been able to read Tronstromer. I would not have been able to read Sorescu or Holub or the, the ancient Chinese and Japanese body of work, which um, completely transformed my understanding as a young woman. You were speaking earlier about um, the marriage of sensuality and spirituality. Uh, there's, there's an anthology out uh, quite long ago, a university press anthology of Sanskrit erotic poetry from earlier, from the second century. Um, yes. the, the Japanese women of the turn of the last millennium from, from the ninth century and the 11th century, two of them I co-translated with the Japanese woman. For me, meeting those poems in the Western tradition, if you find poems, Eros is sometimes Eros and is sometimes a sort of metaphorical analog for speaking about the spiritual. Um, poems of the spiritual sometimes use erotic terminology, but in these few places in the world's history, you had poets who were equally explicitly, frankly, celebrating both, not one as a language in which to describe the other. And as a young woman, when I first accounted those poems, I was so happy because it was telling me I did not need to compartmentalize my life that you don't need to sacrifice one part of a life in order to enter another part of a life. And I think that division is stronger in the Western spiritual lineages than it is in several different bodies of work that, that uh, come from different traditions. And so, you know, the exposure to, to different poems and different traditions, this is how it enlarges a life. It enlarges our sense of what is possible and changes us and leads to what I heard in both of your poems during the readings, this enormous tenderness for the variety of existence, tenderness towards mud, tenderness towards, you know, the fact that even, even a tree fallen creates the space for new life. These are realizations we need to get through the day. Through the, through the ordinary hardships of a day and their realizations we need in order to get through a life in a way that is large rather than narrowed. Um, I'll just throw in a couple of questions from the audience watching. Um, Kartik is asking, uh, do you have a vague picture of whom you're writing for? Do you think it matters? Uh, Jean Hall is asking, so much of what poets write about today is rooted in the past, particularly rural communities and landscapes. What will people look back on to write about in 20 years time from now to inspire them? Anyone want to, anyone want to jump in on that question? Jane Clark with the rural angle. Well, and, and maybe the first question, you know, who am I writing for? Um, it's, it's interesting. I do think that's one of the things about live readings. Jane was saying earlier, the loss of, of live readings, the loss of contact with your audience, the loss of the relationship with the audience, the direct relationship. And it was funny, the other night um, I was uh, on, a, on a Zoom with a group who had read my book and one of the woman, women said, I felt as if I'd, not only was I in your poems, I felt as if I'd written them myself. <laughs> and 
thought that was really amazing. And so I do think that kind of answers that question that, that you're writing for that person in a way. You're writing for the person who will feel that level of empathy and that level of connection. And if that person is outside of your little world, all the better. That's what's really exciting for me as a writer, you know, and I keep getting surprised that people, you know, you know, in other parts of the world are in very different uh, experiences of life to me when they find the poems and find something there. And, you know, so, uh, but I mean, I suppose, first of all, you write your poem for yourself, you know, but then after that, I, what I'm doing is just trying to make it as good as possible so that it will travel. You know, because it's 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 how well you 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 hone it, then it travels wherever. But if you keep it just as this expression for yourself, then it is just something you know deeply personal and made, and very valuable, but not of value to the world. It's that work on the editing, I think, that makes it something that could be of value for a larger audience. But I didn't answer the rural question, so I let someone else answer that. <laughs> well, you don't have to. <laughs> I, I can speak to that, but I, I'd like to hear Aaron Dottie speak to it first because I loved your reference to the suburbs um, when you said, I'm a poet of the suburbs. So it seems to me you might have something to, to bring into this. <laughs> Well, I was talking about the suburbs uh, in relation to the divine, but on the other hand, it is also true that I live in a city that uh, is kind of, uh, it's an inescapable reality. So it's part of my life and it in some way leaks into my poems. So I've been known as a city of, uh, as, a, as a Bombay poet and not without reason because Bombay is an inextricable part of many of my collections. So, I'm not sure I could, in fact, I'm, I'm curious to know what you would have said, Jane, I mean, Jane Clark, because you actually grew up on a farm, mm -hmm. am I right? Yes. So that would be interesting to me. I write a lot about the city, but in fact, it is in this book that I found, and this was not intentional, but I found earth and sky, as I said, water. There's a lot of water in this, bo in this book and a lot of earth, much more than any of the others. This happened and it wasn't planned. As for the first question, I want to very quickly answer Karthik's question. I just want to say that um, I think I write for my notion of a perfect listener, an ideal listener. And there's a lovely word in uh, Sanskrit, which is sahridaya, that is a like-hearted person, someone who is a fine-tuned, attentive listener. And I think of that person in some way, he often, he or she doesn't often have a name or face, but that's my idea of the perfect listener who's there somewhere. And if you're lucky on occasion, you meet her. But um, that's often who I'm writing for. Arundhati, you also spend a lot of time um, on an ashram, don't you? Yes, do you, do. Do you write about the city from the ashram? In fact, the odd thing was, Neil, that when I moved to the ashram, I found myself writing about the city like never before. So I think that happens too. As I often say, when my spiritual journey took on a certain intensity, the poems became more erotic. So I think it's really because we are living as gloriously messy, a seamless uh, mix of all these uh, seeming polarities, which aren't polarities at all. So that's a short answer, but I could, have, I could go on, but I'd love to hear Jane respond as well. So to, to, to the audience question, I will simply say, I am such a profound introvert that I must forget audience in order to write. Um, some of my poems in more recent years have become public speaking poems. I think from decades of being a person who implausibly found herself speaking in public um, and that awareness does come in, but mostly I am wrestling with questions that trouble me, that fracture me, that I myself need to come to some new relationship to. And so I have to forget audience because an introvert doesn't like to be looked at. And I forget audience because I am simply wrestling with something difficult and only later might it go out to be seen by other people. But for the, for the rural urban question really interests me because I hear under it perhaps an equal question, which is a question of contemporary life 
versus um, life that feels to many people who live in cities um, uncontemporary, not theirs, not their vocabulary. And you know, my I grew up in Manhattan and fled to the wilderness as 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 soon as I had my own life in my own hands. So I've certainly experienced both. Now I find cities quite overwhelming, um, but I still refer to them from time to time. Um, more. More my concern when I think about, you know, there is a vocabulary of existence, the natural world, light, dark, birdsong, rain, weather, seas. These are both currently important because they are so imperiled by our human activities, but also they are universally comprehensible because everybody knows light and dark. And so they become ways of speaking that can be shared across any circumstance. But we must be speaking to our own time. And for me, a lot of that has come into, this most recent book is certainly more engaged with um, uh, the crises of our moment, the crises of social compact, the crises of the biosphere. But also one of the things which has increasingly come into my own work is the vocabulary of the sciences. And I'm not sure that I read poems uh, today which, which show that as much as the full body of work does. But you know, when, when a, book, a book back before this has, has naturetic polypeptide B in it, you know, the name of the protein which is responsible uh, for conveying the sensation of itch. And that was a fresh discovery in 2013, I think it was. And it just thrilled me to think that, you know, this might be the first use of naturetic polypeptide B in a poem. Um, and, and, and I needed it to say what I needed to say, but I also was very happy to expand my own diction in such a way. And that sort of runs increasingly through the work. Um, you know, a poem all the way back in 1982 was using terms from physics because that is what came to me. But it does seem to me that to write of one's own time is to participate in the diction of one's own time. And that can be done um, in choices of syntax and style. It can be done in terms of subject matter and it can be done in terms of vocabulary and what metaphors and images leap in. But I, you know, I don't feel, so I, I too live in a kind of suburb, um, but I feel so close to the vocabulary, both of uh, the wilderness poets, and then, you know, the John Clare poets of, of the agricultural countryside. And then, you know, even, even if you go to the past, you know, um, uh, the industrialization of William Blake. For me, all vocabularies offer gates. And I don't much think that gate doesn't belong to me because of such and so. I want to be able to walk through all of the gates. Mm -hmm. I just I want to add, can I just say very quickly that I feel that in my Bombay poems as well, I was just thinking back on this, I feel the natural and the cultural, that mix, the, the world of nature and culture that we often see as binaries aren't really so at all and certainly not in the poems. And I enjoy the ways in which they come together in an image sometimes, the natural world and the world of culture in ways that, 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 that make it fun for me to wrestle with, uh, with language in ways that bring it together. And here, I must say in the other Yad poems, it was wonderful to be able to talk about a woman who lived centuries ago and at the same time, bring in a whole litany of skin cream ingredients. So I like to think, Jane, that this is the first time that alpha hydroxy acids and uh, <laughs> propylene glycol have made their way into a poem. So I love I enjoy that. <laughs> Just gonna say, I think gates are important in all of your work. I mean, it's a very strong image, I think, which is common to everything you do and also your translations, Jane. Would you like to ask anything of each other? Yes, over coffee, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Several things. Um, 
gosh, that's a pause. That's an important mm. pause. Well, I I already did one, so so I figure it's it's <laughs> your your turn. I already asked the question of of you know late influences from other literatures. So yeah, I would actually be curious to know. Um, for one, I would like to know Jane as in Jane Clark. I'd love to know something more about the ways in which, what it really meant to be growing up on that farm and where you are now. I want to be able to visualize in some way. Yeah, well, I, I, I was thinking about that in relation to that question, Jean Hall's yes. question about what we'll be writing about in the future. And you see, I only started to write in my early forties. So by that time, in, in between, you know, I grew up on a farm in Roscommon, left when I was 17, then was in Dublin for 15 years. And then with my partner, we moved to Wicklow. So by the time I started to write, I was back in the country again. But also, it reminded me a bit about what you said, Aaron Dati. I think you were saying about a kind of a time of spiritual challenge that you turned to a different group of, group of poets. Because I was in my 30s involved in, you know, training as a psychoanalyst and very involved in my own psychoanalytics uh, journey. And it was then that I turned to poets. Um, but I suppose what I'm saying is that time in Dublin, those 15 years were so important in my life. And yet I've written so little about it. And I would love to be able to, you know, but I, I, I think it's a bit like, you know, in psychoanalysis, everything goes back to those early years. And that those early years I found when I started to write poetry were so influential. And so even though, you know, at 17, I wanted to get away, you know, to be a young woman growing up on a farm in County Roscommon, what I felt was restrictions everywhere. Um, and yet in then, fact, you went to India for a little while, didn't you? Yes, I, I went, to, I was in India then for three months, one, one summer. And the summer I was 19, I think. And, uh, you know, I was saying to Aaron Dati earlier that that was, that just kind of really opened up the world to me and an understanding. It was really, I remember at that stage, you had to fly from London to India. It couldn't fly from Ireland. So getting the boat into Dunleary and looking around and seeing Ireland anew because I'd been in India for three months. You know, I mean, it was just incredible the, the everything, the colours, the sounds, the tastes, everything was different because I'd been so immersed in such a different world for three months. And I'll always be grateful for that experience. Um, and what I felt was the huge difference of India, but also because we both had this colonial experience and we shared the literature, we shared, we shared radio, television, we had so many references that we shared. And even around the time of, you know, Ireland's independence, uh, India and Ireland were very connected. Um, so, I, I mean, I've gone all, off on all kinds of different spins, but I suppose, I mean, maybe I come back to that the, you know, the farm I grew up on did give me a way of writing, gave me the vocabulary. It's a bit like what Jane was saying, any vocabulary is, is a wonder. And it, it somehow, but I think it's because of the connection to heart. You know, for me, poetry is so much connected to heart, to that muse, the muse of the heart. And um, so I think Jean's question about what would people be writing about in the future fills me with sadness, actually. I think that's why I've been kind of quiet about it. You know, that question, what will we have to write about it? And that's maybe why what we're doing now is so important to try and, you know, sing the praise of what we do have before we lose it. You know? We're going to have to wind up soon, um, but Jane, you mentioned spiritual challenge, and I don't think I would be allowed to let all three of you go away without saying something about the relationship between the spiritual challenge in your life and, and your poetry. Um, you've touched on it. Uh, you didn't mention that I learned earlier this evening that you'd actually been a volunteer at Mother Teresa's. <laughs> um, but maybe, maybe we could start with you and you could kick off and 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 then um Arundhati and and Jane Hirschfield can can jump yeah. in yeah with, with their own stories of that of of the, that particular 
crossover time, if you like. Yeah, well, I suppose, um, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a believer and I wasn't a believer since very young. And that's that I refer to that as a th in one of my poems, the kind of ongoing argument with my father about religion and belief and everything. But um, I suppose one of the things that was very important to me when Gillian Clark was my tutor, when I was, you know, the wonderful Welsh poet, and she gave me permission, she said, you know, whether you believe now or not, the religion that you've been brought up in is a wonderful resource to you, inevitably, in influencing your poetic voice and your the, the well in, from which your poetry comes. So I suppose for me, uh, writing is a, a spiritual practice, as my yoga is, and you know, as walking is, and as looking at nature intently, but definitely uh, writing is part of that for me, yeah. Jane, Jane Hirschfeld? Ah, so um, I tend to want when I'm out in the world as a poet to keep the particulars of my, of my spiritual practice less spoken because they can become a barrier to understanding rather than a gate. And, and my own training uh, has been in Zen and, and Zen is the one that likes to go quietly and visibly about the world going back to the marketplace and looking like a regular person running the tea house and looking like, you know, just a normal old lady except the way she wipes the counter. There's some attention there. Um, but as, as probably most people who know my work know, I spent uh, eight years in formal Zen training and three of them in a monastery in the wilderness with no electricity and no heat and uh, no air conditioning. And, and it was formative and it was central. And I did it, you know, so a childhood of writing, university, you know, undergraduate, bent on poetry, and then I simply walked away from it all for, for those, that decade of my life, for my 20s, because it was so clear to me that I could never be much of a poet or anything else if I didn't understand more of what it was to be a human being. And for me, that meant the practice of Zen, the practice of attentiveness, the practice of learning courage, the practice of learning to inhabit my own experience without being defined by my own identity. Um, and that's as much as I think I wish to say about this. But, you know, you shouldn't need to have the names for it to recognize it. Um, that's what poets can do. Uh, you know, entire worldviews sit inside a reference to a bowl or a reference to a leaf or a reference to uh, Hydro alpha, hydroxy alpha, whatever that you know that lotion was. Um, uh, it it is our job to translate our particulars into the detail that does not create a barricade of well, I don't believe that, so that's not a poet for me. Um, so I read the Catholic poets and I read the Hindu poets and I read the the Protestant poets and I read the Jewish poets and I read the absolutely utterly secular poets and I read the indigenous poets. And all of that is the fabric of experience for me. Um, but Thank yes, you. my training was Zen. Thank you, Jane. And it's all about the universal in the particular, the universal in the local. I think that's been coming through in all your readings. Um, Arundhati. Yes, so I think I'd agree with, uh, with what you said, Jane. I know that when um, I started writing, my prose turned towards very overtly writing about Indian spiritual traditions. And when that happened, the question I was often asked is, you know, are you a spiritual poet? And I've always had it, uh, I found that a very difficult question to answer because I want to say yes, but only if your idea of the spiritual includes uh, you know, cities and uh, orange lunch boxes and uh, uh, all the crazy stuff that makes up my life and which is an, also an important part of the poems, love, 
of various kinds, lust of different kinds, all of that is part and parcel of the whole journey. In fact, as I said earlier, it is as my spiritual journey undertook a certain, just sort of intensified, that I realized that the poems were growing more overtly passionate, more overtly erotic in some ways, which was the paradox. I, I think I was just a bit of an innocent. I grew up believing that most of my answers would come from art, that is primarily literature, but also dance and theater that I was passionately excited about. And I thought it would come largely from there and from my reading of philosophy. But there came a time in my life when all of that seemed absolutely inadequate. When I plunged into something that I call uh, a kind of confrontation with wordlessness, when language did not rescue me. And my only way, the only way I could claw myself out of that experience was in fact to start looking, seeking in a way that um, I hadn't before. I'd been a closet seeker perhaps, but I had to come out of the closet. Mm -hmm. So it was when I came out of the closet that I found that all these other compartments that we live by, head and heart, um, weekday and weekend, uh, poet, curator, critic, uh, seeker, none of these compartments uh, seemed to hold anymore. All those watertight compartments began to dissolve. So it wasn't me trying to prove now that I was spiritual as much as many of those walls just fell away. And there are many more still left to go. But uh, I have a guru. And for me as a spiritual guide, he's been invaluable. And there is a still unfolding journey which takes me periodically to the yoga center, but it is a practice that one can carry wherever one goes. And uh, I hope that there is a deepening. I'd like to believe there is. Thank you, Arundhati. Um, I'm going to throw this at you. I don't know if it's fair, but um, you have a poem called Prayer, which I think you know. And I was wondering whether you might say it to finish our reading. I haven't uh, warned you in advance about that. But, um... No, you haven't. But <laughs> if I the first line, I might be able to. I must just remember the first line and then it will happen. Prayer. May things stay the way they are in the simplest place you know. May the shuttered windows keep the air as cool as bottled jasmine. May you never forget to listen to the crumpled whisper of sheets that mold themselves to your sleeping form. May your pillows always be silvered with cat down and the muted percussion of a lover's breath. May the murmur of the wall clock continue to decree that your providence run 10 minutes slow. May nothing be disturbed in the simplest place you know, for it is here in the fetal hush that blueprints dissolve and poems begin and faith spreads like the hum of crickets. Faith in a time when maps shall fade, nostalgia sees and the vigil end. Thank you, Arundhati. On that note, um, we're going to finish what I think was an extraordinary reading and discussion. Certainly one of the most remarkable I've ever been privileged to be part of. I'd like to thank Jane Hirschfield, Jane Clark, and Arundhati, Arundhati Subramaniam for joining us tonight for this wonderful event. And if you're watching now on YouTube and you click on read more, you can find details of their books and I do hope you'll want to buy them right away. So thank you very much. And thank you very much everyone for watching and listening uh, tonight. It's been a wonderful event. Thank you. <laughs>